Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining me today for what promises to be an insightful discussion about an important new book about a significant, if often overlooked, part of the globe. My name is James Barnett, and I'm a non-resident research fellow at Hudson Institute. I'm dialing in today from West Africa to talk about the other side of the continent with my friend and colleague Tom Gardner, correspondent for The Economist and author of a much-anticipated new book on the tumultuous transformation of Ethiopia since the late 2010s. When Abiy Ahmed unexpectedly became Ethiopia's prime minister in April 2018, he rapidly unleashed a wave of liberal political and economic reforms and shocked the world by making peace with longtime foe Eritrea, earning him international adoration, culminating in the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize. Yet just a year later, Africa's second largest state had descended into a horrific civil war that would leave hundreds of thousands dead and tarnish Abiy's reformist image. Yet even as his regime risked collapse during the war, Abiy ultimately emerged victorious now ruling over a country at once internally unstable and regionally ambitious. This transformation of Ethiopia is aptly and incisively documented in Tom's forthcoming book, The Abi Project, God, Power, and War in the New Ethiopia. I was privileged to get an advanced copy of the book, which you can see here is a bit beat up from accompanying me on my recent travels. And I'm equally privileged to have Tom join us on Hudson today for a discussion on Ethiopia's future in the strategically vital, quite volatile Red Sea region. As a bit of background, Tom was the economist correspondent in Addis Ababa from 2016 to 2022, during which time he saw Ethiopia's transformation firsthand, from the initial high hopes engendered by Abiy's breakneck reforms, to the growing warning sign that Ethiopia's transition was spinning off the rails, to the horrific civil war that broke out only two and a half years after Abiy's ascent to power. Drawing on hundreds of interviews with Abiy's greatest admirers and most committed enemies alike, this book, which is now available in the United Kingdom via Hearst Publishers and will soon be out in the U.S. via uh, Oxford University Press, chronicles the rise, fall, and rise again of Abiy Ahmed, who I will wager is one of the most consequential and controversial world leaders in recent history. This book is full of new insights that will be of interest to even the most seasoned observers of the Horn of Africa, and it's a real pleasure to have Tom here to discuss this with us today. Tom, greetings from Abuja. It's great to have you joining us today. Hi, James. How are you doing? Great to be on. Fine. Thank you. Our pleasure. So thanks again, Tom. There's uh, so much to discuss in this book and uh, about contemporary Ethiopia more broadly, but I want to start with one interesting observation. Ethiopia has experienced such a whirlwind of change since Abiy took power at the height of the protest crisis that was rocking the then entrenched authoritarian regime in early 2018. And as, I, as you amply document in your book, the period of 2018 to 2023 hardly had a month go by without some significant, even seismic development for Ethiopia and the region, be it good or bad. Uh, there was the initial nine or 12 months of liberalization, which is the honeymoon period you call Abiy mania, followed by a year of these escalating tensions, various bombings, assassinations and the like, uh, a quasi coup attempt, if you will, and then culminating in the civil war that broke out in, in November 2020 in least of two devastating years. Um, and that only gets us to 2022, of course, to say nothing of some of the more recent developments since the formal end of the civil war, which I hope to discuss briefly at the end. So for a book of contemporary political analysis about a leader who took power only six years ago, some readers might be surprised if they were to turn to the back of the book to the chronology section you have here, uh, which begins, I quote, second century AD, kingdom of Axum becomes a regional trading power. Mm -hmm. You're well aware that I uh, enjoy classical antiquity as much as the next guy, um, but your reference to Axum isn't kind of some bit of trivia about trading networks in the Roman Red Sea. You very convincingly and concisely, I would add, lest any readers are worried that this is kind of an unwieldy academic tome, uh, you articulate in your first chapter that Abiy's rise to power in 2018 has to be understood in the context of a highly contested historical debate about essentially what kind of state Ethiopia is, and that this debate is very alive and really at the center in many ways of contemporary Ethiopian politics. So I'm hoping you can start out by explaining this context a bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I do realize that the, the, un, the unfamiliar reader might might find that reference to 3000 odd years ago, the acts of my empire a bit, a bit surprising. But yes, one of the arguments of, of the book is that Ethiopia's current predicament, its crisis has to be understood, at least in part, not exclusively, but certainly in part as a uh, boiling down to a clash of, of visions between uh, different camps, different ideas of what Ethiopia is, what it has been, and you know, by extension, what it could be in the future. But yes, these are essentially 
battles over Ethiopian national identity and therefore Ethiopia's national story. And that story is hugely contested because on the one hand, this is the way I kind of boil it down in, in the book, on the one hand, you have uh, those who argue that Ethiopia is an ancient na nation, one that dates back 3000 years or more to the kind of proto-Ethiopian kingdom, if you will, of Aksum, which is now up in, which is now situated in what is now northern Tigray region of Ethiopia. Uh, and then on the other, on the other hand, and I'm obviously simplifying, but the other, the other camp um, who sees Ethiopia as a fundamentally modern construct, the product of um, empire building in the late 19th century. So dating back perhaps no more than 150 years. From there is there a second kind of related debate, which is well, it's highly related, um, which is, is Ethiopia one nation or is it in fact an assemblage of, of many different ones? And that might sound a bit kind of abstruse, but actually that those differing interpretations of Ethiopia's nation, uh, national history and national identity, you know, what is Ethiopia? Is it one nation or many? From there stems um, differing arguments or different conclusions about what kind of system, what kind of political system Ethiopia should have today. And that's really the kind of the, the most contentious question in Ethiopian politics. And that was the most contentious question. Certainly, you know, once Abiy comes to power in 2018, you have this kind of, it becomes very stark, very clear that you have two, the fundamental divide in Ethiopian politics. And that's not to say there aren't, isn't a spectrum of opinion, which of course there is, but the, the fundamental divide is between those, for want of a better term, call themselves sort of Ethiopianists or pan-Ethiopianists, who see Ethiopia as a kind of single nation dating back potentially about you know, 3,000 years. And then again, for want of a better, better term, the ethno-nationalists, those who uh, come from uh, the Oromo nationalist camp, the Tigrayan nationalist camp, just to give two, two prominent examples, who see Ethiopia um, as essentially a multinational entity and therefore support the current constitution, which was introduced in 1995 and defines Ethiopia as a multinational entity, a voluntary union of um, different nations, nationalities, and peoples. This is a terminology, and I guess it's getting a bit in the weeds, but this, this is a terminology to kind of derive from, from Stalin and Lenin. Um, it's the sort of um, thinking uh, which un underlay the Soviet Union as a multinational federation and, the, and Yugoslavia the, as a multinational federation. Um, so by 2018, it became very clear that Abiy or the debates around which which direction the transition that Abiy had ushered in should go came down to the question of where you stood on on that nine, this nine, this very contested 1995 constitution and the idea of what kind of federal system Ethiopia should should be under. It's been a 30 years of what is you know a multinational federal system or to its detractors an ethnic federal system. Those 30 years. It's been very contested and now or by 2018 with increasing um, ethnic violence in much of the country as the country became much more unstable that question of is this the right political system uh, for ethiopia became much much more live and I, I argue in the book that that debate and the clash the clash of visions ultimately does lead to war yeah, thanks. No, that's it's a fascinating discussion, and it's true that it is. Uh, you know, it, it can maybe seem a bit in the weeds at points. But I also think it's it's very important to understanding Ethiopian history that these these uh, highly theoretical questions were actually very much kind of animating of of what's called the the Ethiopian students' movements of the '60s and '70s. And I know you quote uh, you know the the historian Bahruzuda and some others who have done really great work on that. But that student movement then became the rebels that overthrew the the Soviet-backed dictator uh, by 1991, and so then th then established that kind of um, you know very unique form of of 
a system that in some ways was it was very authoritarian, but also kind of uh, in some senses created more uh, overt uh, kind of freedom of association for the different ethnic groups within Ethiopia. And so that was essentially the the system that found itself in crisis in 2017, 2018, and then then Abi took over. So I'm, I'm curious if, if you can talk a bit about Abi's reforms, both why they didn't turn out as planned, and, and you alluded to this with kind of this tension between the, uh, you know, the, the centralizing versus the decentralizing tendencies. But I'm also very curious if I can also add on a, another question, which is that, you know, why is it that Abi engendered such high hopes internationally? I think that there's a whole argument to be had about, you know, the, the people of Ethiopia having lived under this, this pretty authoritarian system that by the late 2010s wasn't even delivering economically as, as much as before. And so it's maybe quite understandable that there was a lot of, uh, of hope for, um, for Abi. But internationally as well, there was this real, as you call it, kind of an, an Abi mania. And it seems that a lot of international observers were, were caught quite off guard by how quickly the transition derailed and, and collapsed into civil war. And I mean, I, I, it's a somewhat personal question because I was watching Ethiopia's transition from afar at the time. Um, so I had far less insight to what was really happening, especially with the kind of ethnic conflict in the peripheries than you would have had actually in the area. But, but even by late 2018, it, it seemed pretty clear that there was a, just kind of reading the English language news reports and NGO reports and stuff, that there were a lot of, uh, I think, what you could call centrifugal forces um, that were kind of pulling apart at the, the center of the country. People soon began to t speak of kind of Yugoslavia-style breakup. Um, but it seemed that for a long time, the, the, the Western policy, U.S. policy, for example, uh, was kind of uh, tried to remain optimistic for a long time that, you know, the, the transition was more or less on track um, and that this was, you know, something to be supported, of course. And since I know you interviewed a number of Western officials uh, for this book, and I, I believe you spent some time in D.C. Uh, for reporting, I'm curious if you could kind of uh, help us understand the evolution of the, the American position or the Western position more broadly towards Ethiopia, um, and particularly kind of what did they get right about the transition or, or what did they maybe get wrong? Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a few different things there because, you know, what, which particular part of Abby's reform agenda are we talking about? I think, I think let's just kind of narrow it down. Maybe there was the political, the, the um, economic, he had a regional agenda as well. Um, he also has, and this is much kind of much more clouded, much more opaque, but he also has a constitutional agenda to to reform that constitution or maybe even totally tear it down the constitution which um i i was talking about earlier i think uh you know to some there were definitely uh for quote unquote liberal reforms on the kind of political economic front and actually the constitutional uh reforms um are seen certainly by some observers as would be would be liberal reforms as well um but abby what he did very very shrewdly and i'll park for now the question of you know how genuine he ever was but he, what he did quite shrewdly uh, immediately on coming to power was was realized the kind of appetite uh within let's say the west uh, and within kind of liberal circles in the west with liberal kind of political establishments in the West for, um, for liberalizing reforms, um, political, economic, and, and to a degree as well, constitutional. Um, I, I think, and I do argue to some degree in the book, Abby genuinely wants to be seen as, as a kind of Western facing, even democratically elected leader. It coexists, the, the, the book goes into a load of tensions within Abby and, the contradictions and maybe I'll part that for now. But on one level he does. He also, I think, sees democratization, liberalizing the economy as a way of cementing his own political um, position by, um, by winning the support of powerful international actors, the US in particular, the US embassy, um, the State Department, the EU. Uh, I think he realizes he comes out of this the EPRDF system. He has a pretty fragile position internally within the coalition. So he looks outside of that uh, of that system for external um, support. One of that, you know, one plank of that comes from comes from the West. So he, he very actively goes out of his way to present himself as this liberalizing 
um, figure. And I have, I actually, I, I, I opened one, the chapter on Abbey Mania with a, um, with an anecdote from Francis Fukuyama, who was one of those kind of, you know, tribunes of the liberal West being invited, who was invited to Ab Abyss and uh, met with Abbey. And Abbey gives him the whole spiel, rule of law, the elections on time. Then, and I think F Fukuyama was slightly thrown by this part. Then he took out, then he took up Fukuyama outside to, to, to plant, plant a, plant a tree. And also he, he asked them to pray because Abbey, another part of Abbey's whole as the title of my subtitle of the book indicates, it's also about it's also about God and his sense of providential right. destiny. But for sure, Abby Abby was telling international interlocutors, in particular, I think the U.S. Embassy in Addis Ababa is is a real a really important actor in this. Um, I, I mm -hmm. cite you know Ambassador Michael Rayner, who was kind of Abby's big cheerleader in Washington. Uh, you know, sort of basically says, "This is our guy." Uh, we're never going to get a more pro-Western leading, pro-Western leader uh, in the, in the region. Uh, Abby also uh, he also just sort of basically in another way, he kind of very shrewdly seduces some of the American officials in particular. Is he says basically, I I'm kind of I'm at least not sympathetic to China in the same way that my predecessors were. I think you know he's he's been quoted as saying to American officials that you know he was he uh, he was suspicious of the godless Marxist communists um, Chinese Communist Party. So he he knows what buttons the press. He's quite you know he spent time in America. His family, wife and kids spent time in America in the 2010s. They actually lived in Denver. Um, mm -hmm. And Abby, I quote some uh, a, a foreign journalist in the book who was one of the few that met with Abby. Uh, in this period, and he just he, he, he quotes Abby saying to him, you know, waxing lyrical about America and then saying, uh, I'm more of a Bay Area kind of guy, you know, um, you know, he really he's clearly, however genuine, I, I mean, I argue that I think his his he is genuinely enamored with the West and America in particular. And part of his project is to make mm -hmm. Ethiopia more like America. Um, so there is a kind of coincidence there of of, of interests. Um, whether Abby uh, really wants to turn Ethiopia into democracy, I think the the answer to that question now is no. Because and that now to get to your kind of the other part of your question, what went wrong? Um, I, I the, the kind of central argument of the book is that Abby conflated his fate with the fate of the nation believed himself to be indispensable um, and prioritized his position over that of the so-called democratic transition, which he had announced to Ethiopians and to the world that he was going to deliver. Uh, as a result of that, um, the kind of difficult work of dialogue, uh, you know, negotiating with different political antagonists, uh, perhaps, you know, and this is a kind of uh, a bit of a certainly in, in the current regime in Ethiopia, but I think maybe historically too, it's a bit of a dirty word, but power, maybe some sharing of power with, with, with opponents or actually establishing a transitional government, um, which would shepherd the country towards elections, all of that, which many were arguing for, were ignored or sidelined or um, set aside. And then the problem in my telling is that key actors in the West and particularly in America uh, just simply refused to, to see the warning signs. They were enamored, they invested financially, but also I think in terms of um, they invested rhetorically, morally in a way in the idea of Abbey the embassy in Addis Ababa had sold Washington the idea of this great reformist. All the diplom all the ambassadors and embassies in Addis Ababa had kind of pitched in and um, got on board this idea of a reformist leader um, to the point that he was, you know, won the Nobel Prize in 2019. And as one one more reflect reflective uh, European ambassador. I remember told me in about 2020 when things were really obviously going awry said well there's kind of egg on your face syndrome right now 
where we all kind of know we we we've we've made a big mistake kind of investing so much in 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 one figure because it was it became it was so obviously personalized around abby um you know the 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 u s embassy and i i'm i'm maybe over uh, maybe being unfair to this particular embassy but it was very important at this point um you know they uh they um had even at some point uh, you know had said they wouldn't they would assign us officials to take you know participate in ethiopian in in ministries to staff ethiopian ministries and all of this so much had um been invested by this point i don't think there was um any willingness to 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 or there was inertia i think and they couldn't they couldn't uh, accept that things were were going wrong and they would need to be some dialogue and engagement with the opposition before it was too late and i think that uh that that, that awakening didn't happen in time well, I'm, I'm very shocked to hear you suggest that the U.S. foreign policy bureaucracy might have a problem dealing with inertia. This is, a, I think, will certainly be news to most viewers. Um, no, I think uh, I, I want to get onto that kind of larger geopolitical question and, and um, uh, you know, specifically to looking at the Tigray War and its aftermath in a moment. But what you were talking about earlier, this uh, kind of uh, obvious prophetic vision. Um, it's something that definitely comes through in the book. I mean, you quote him a lot talking about himself as, uh, you know, he, he says that there was this prophecy that his mother had that he would become a king. Um, there's one very colorful anecdote where he claims uh, that while serving in Rwanda as a UN peacekeeper, some, uh, you know, a, a French woman had fallen in love with him and, and wanted to, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, wanted to um, him to elope with her. And he says, oh, you know, she she wouldn't have appreciated, you know, the man who would have been a king or something. So he has there's certainly that element that that I think you've highlighted well. Um, but, you know, the, the the book is more than, I think, uh, when, in terms of talking about religion in Ethiopia, it, it seems more than just a kind of personal, or I, I should say it is, it does seem very much that God, uh, that Abi, sorry, it sees himself on, on kind of a, a God-given mission to transform Ethiopia and even the world. Um, but your book as well, which again, the subtitle does start, you know, God, power, and war in the new Ethiopia. It also deals with kind of the, the broader religious dimensions of Ethiopian society, which I think is very interesting because Ethiopia is typically talked about by kind of external observers and academics and stuff very much through the lens of ethnicity more than religion uh, in comparison to say a country like Nigeria, where I am, where there's often a lot of talk about say religious tensions or, or what have you and religious coexistence. In Ethiopia, the emphasis is often on ethnicity. But your book does a very good job of showing in a number of chapters that actually Abi has also, uh, you know, beyond just the rhetoric of himself as kind of this prophetic individual, he's really kind of contributed in some ways or maybe, I don't know, accelerated uh, a kind of religious transformation in Ethiopia and that he's used religion a lot as kind of a a tool of policy, if you will. Uh, and so I'd be curious if you can maybe explain a, a bit about that. And for you know some of our viewers who won't know, uh, you know, Ethiopia traditionally this this uh, has one of the oldest Christian Orthodox churches, but also a sizable Muslim population, and then a, a growing uh, Pentecostal movement, which uh, to which Abi subscribes. So I'd be curious to hear just uh, a few thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah. So one of the, the the points I make is that Abi, as much as he is this kind of singular idiosyncratic individual, he is also very much obviously a product of the society which made him, and in particular, I. I think he is emblematic of trends um, which take off really in the two, 1990s and 2000s, as you, you know, as you alluded to, the rise of the growth of Pentecostalism, mostly at the expense of the Orthodox Church, Ethiopia's traditional historic church. Um, but you know, the numbers of people converting, uh, and it sort of ties in. It sort of relates to uh, the spread of urbanization as well. Um, in this period as well, another very important trend. Mm -hmm. um, but you have, you know, a lot of young, young people um, joining Pentecostal churches, and particularly after in, by the 2000s, joining um, churches which are kind of subscribing to varying degrees to a form of prosperity gospel. And that Abby doesn't, doesn't, doesn't kind of openly identify as kind of prosperity gospel, but you know, 
he names his he names the new party which he founded in 2019 the prosperity party so you know right. it's not it's not that subtle um and he for him it is it is um i think that is i think as you as you as you say he's used it as a as a kind of as a tool religion as a tool i mean he uses religious language rhetoric as a tool of political mobilization and persuasion during the war in Tigray, that was very, very obvious. Um, he also, he's also kind of in the way he's um, managed the internal politics of the, the churches, uh, or the evangelical Pentecostal churches, but also the Orthodox Church and also Muslim um, communities. He's intervened in, in different way in, 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 in the kind of internal politics of these communities basically presenting himself as a, as a mediator or as a, as a, as a peacemaker or, or as a unifier. And in that way, he's sought to kind of use religion in a, not specifically in a kind of Christian or sectarian way, but as a tool for buttressing his own authority. Um, he's managed to win the support, at least of the, the a good part of the kind of Muslim and Pentecostal um, establishments. Uh, and that's been quite a big part, I think, of his of his political project. The Orthodox Church is a slightly different question because, yes, he he at first he he, he won a lot of support within the Orthodox hierarchy. Less so now, though, but you know, for 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 reason kind of complicated reasons to do with his management of the uh, the Amhara region, which is now one of those regions, um, the main region now, uh, up in arms against him. So I've kind of parked that, but. Um, so those are kind of two ways he's used religion. And then the third way is policy, because I think the, the example I look at most closely in the book is the way he's um, gentrified and beautified Addis Ababa, but also some smaller towns as well. But like the focus, an unbelievably um, visible um, focus on Addis Ababa, its aesthetics, its um, built environment, you know, he's built all these kind of parks, palaces, libraries, science museums, uh, you know, the whole historic core of the city has been kind of demolished and rebuilt. And his idea is it will become like a kind of gleaming Gulf metropolis. But there is a, I believe there is a, and I argue in the book that there is a, a kind of religious element to this. He sort of, according to um, a, a, an aspect of prosperity gospel thinking, um, you know, a kind of beautiful, prosperous city is but one is but one step on the road to heaven, and he has made it very clear that his theory of development is one which you know you start here on your own doorstep, start with the palace and the city, and the rest of the country will follow. That's his kind of theory of development or his theory of change, and I think that has a that, that does derived to some degree from from religious sources from Pentecostal sources um, there are other sources more secular sources as well uh, positive thinking and self-help thinking this idea that you yeah you I, he's once quoted as saying just to, specifically on the city and its beautification he's once quoted I think in 2019 saying you know the eye must see a beautiful thing if it is to create a beautiful thing um, this is absolutely kind of essential fundamental to to his worldview i think it has has to some degree religious quite important religious um uh, sources and uh and that's one of the you know kind of one of the most visible ways in which he's sort of transformed the country in his own image um yeah no no thank you i mean it's a it's a fascinating um discussion that you have there in the book and yeah you do and you include some photos as well about uh, kind of showing even the, the transformation of, of Addis Ababa. Um, and I, I'd like to kind of shift the conversation momentarily to a, a, a kind of forward-looking discussion of where you see Ethiopia's uh, role in the world or the broader Red Sea region today. But it'd be very remiss, of course, if we didn't uh, discuss the, the Tigray War, which has kind of become this, um, 
I mean, in many ways, it's 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 been the defining aspect of Abi's tenure so far, right? And in some ways, kind of the tragedy of of how do you go in essentially just a year from winning the Nobel Peace Prize for you know genuinely making a peace with a, a longtime foe and and ending a conflict that had been kind of one of these frozen conflicts bedeviling the region for a long time. But then immediately transcend into a, a civil war that I think really shocked a lot of outside observers in in its brutality, um, in its you know the atrocities uh, committed by both sides, but very particularly as as multiple reports and and you know UN uh, inspections uh, revealed the the use of starvation as a weapon of war uh, by government forces against the Tigrayans, um, and also a war that was you know frankly very much. Uh, um, you know, a combination in some ways, it seems, of kind of World War I uh, mass wave kind of trench warfare and mass wave tactics, and then these new kind of technologies of drones, uh, drones loitering munitions and all this stuff. I mean, there's there's so much to discuss about that Tigray War from the humanitarian perspective, the military perspective. But I'm curious if you can just kind of, uh, you know, describe for us, as, as you do in the book, kind of how it is that the country could undergo that rapid of transit of, of a shift from Abi the peacemaker to Ethiopia being the site of one of the largest, uh, most intense conflicts of the 21st century. And then ultimately how it is that Abi managed to win that war. Small um, question, I know. Yeah, small question. Um, yeah. Well, I think I, I would I would start by saying that, and just to kind of link back to what I was saying previously about how outsiders, Westerners, uh, and many in Addis Ababa, kind of blinding themselves to what was was really going on. It wasn't so much just about Abbey's Kind of reluctance to engage with the opposition and also to to pursue a serious democratic democratization process it was also the fact that the country was even from the from almost day one from when he took power the country was also in turmoil um you have and there you know there are many causes and abby is not the sole author of this in any way because he inherits this it accelerates under on his watch but he inherits this a state which is rapidly uh, weakening. Uh, this is one of the strongest states in Africa at the time. This is widely seen as one of the strongest, you know, authoritarian, but you know, certainly had a monopoly on violence. Right. Clearly, by 2018, it does not. And you see, right. um, 2018, three million people by one official estimate, or, um, kind of the UN estimate, uh, people were displaced. Uh, from violent from violence fighting uh, conflict in in 2018 alone that's that made that made ethiopia the number one uh, country for forced displacement uh, in the world in that year and that you know this was before right. i won the nobel peace prize and people, right. there was this kind of dissonance there was always this dissonance which uh there was far, just kind of far too little serious attempts to understand what really was going on, but yes, the the state was weakening. One of the one of the problems or consequences of the political opening that he did, uh, on you know, he certainly did, in, you know, accelerate or inaugurate or initiate a political opening of you know, rebel movements were invited back. It was all very chaotic, and that's a big part of why things went wrong. It was not not sequ sequenced in the in, in a sensible way. There were um, peace agreements with with rebel movements coming back from 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 abroad, which were opaque. No one really knew um, what had been signed, uh, which gave you know laid the seeds for in differing interpretations about who was violating the agreement. But anyway, that's just to say, um, kind of ethnic or communal violence, for want of a better term, had exploded in several parts of the country in 2018, and then by 2019. Before the war in Tigray, there was a war already in Aromia, his home region, where returning rebels, the Oromo Liberation Front, or a faction of them, which became the Oromo Liberation Army, the OLA, um, had returned to the bush. They they hadn't put that um, they hadn't put down their arms. In fact, they'd returned to the bush and disillusioned um, young people who didn't trust Abby, didn't 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 kind of 
believe in in the promises he was making um, uh, increasingly join joined the insurgency which was dealt with ferociously by by the federal army and then by the regional security forces um, so even by so by 2020 the year the Tigray war began you actually have a very substantial uh, war underway um, in in Abbey's own region, the biggest region in the country, Aromia. Um, you have um, different factions and different groups in other parts of the country also um, up in arms. I would point to Beni Shangul Gomuz, a region which probably never gets talked about in you know international media. Uh, right. But there was a really significant conflict underway there as well. Um, and then, yeah, I think when it comes to Tigray and the, the TPLF, uh, the, the ruling party in Tigray for, for, for many decades and the kind of leading um, component of the EPRDF coalition government, which Abbey inherited and then disposed of, um, they had been clearly extremely uncomfortable with the direction of the transition um they had and i'm simplifying here again they had essentially agreed to a sort of negotiated exit from the pinnacle of the state the kind of pinnacle of power uh, in 2018 and they i think they believed that they had done this in good faith and that abby had taken power and sort of immediately uh, betrayed that trust that they'd placed in him uh, by pursuing what they saw as selective justice, selective accountability, blaming Tigrayans and the TPLF for the sins of the past 27 years, EPRDF years, kind of rewriting the EPRDF years as specifically TPLF years. Um, the um, kind of in what they saw, and I think rightly kind of wholesale or precipitous removal of Tigrayans from the first from the federal government upper echelons were then increasingly from 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 the you know the state writ large from the nat kind of the national economy all of this uh where um to some degree and in some elements they had been um well represented maybe disproportionate to their numbers that's certainly the, the that was the accusation at the time but they felt scapegoated and that's the crucial point they felt very scapegoated and fearful and you know I don't think there is any very, very few conflicts in uh, in, in, in history um, has the element of fear, that emotional power of fear not being unbelievably important. And this was really important in the Tigray case. Um, the Tigrayans, led by the TPLF, felt um, that they were being singled out. And they Tigray itself as a region is very, very Kind of acutely vulnerable because of its history of i mean it's it's resource poor but also its history of um famine uh and also the fact that it was encircled by this point by hostile regions and up north a hostile country in the form of eritrea which and this is really why they were re this is probably the single thing that made them most uh angry and and and, and betrayed by i felt feeling betrayed by abby uh, but also fearful and paranoid about what, what the future had in store. Abby's deal with Azaya Safawerki, the president of Eritrea, um, which he made very little effort to um, depict as, 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 as not a kind of political pact, uh, you know, assembled... Uh, with a common enemy and co common enemy in view, the common enemy being the TPLF. Eritrea is, you know, Eritrea and it's either Af Azais Afwerki having a their own historic um, uh, conflict with 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 the TPLF, um, and Abi having his own kind of political rivalries with the TPLF as well. So this was, from the TPLF point of view, this was a. They were surrounded with Amhara as well to the south, which had its own historic mm -hmm. um, reasons to be um, hostile to the to the TPLF, and was very clearly preparing to to 
use force to reclaim territories that they said Tigray had, had illegally annexed from them. Um, by 2020, it was clear that, you know, there was this drumbeat and it was felt, and I went to see, I went to Tigray in, in, in October, well, so a couple of times in 2020, but just the week before the war began. And the sense of encirclement by enemies, um, the, um, the, the belief that Abbey and Isaias and the Amhara were about to launch a war. Uh, you know, I think that was, a, and I document this in the book, that was not a, that was not a um, uh, unjustified belief. That was a, that was a reality. I mean, Abbey was clearly, Abbey and Isaias were clearly, and the Amhara were clearly preparing for war. Uh, the Grayans had made a choice themselves that, or well, the TPLF had made a choice themselves that they would fight and resist any attempts to, to disarm them, to, to remove them from power in Tigray. Um, and they also, well, you know, I'm going through the chronology here, um, a bit selectively, but the last point I would say, then there was the election, the Tigray election, uh, which was held in September, 2020. And that was a significant, um, escalation in the, on the part of the, Tigray, the TPLF, I think, um, in the sense that, um, the federal elections have been delayed because of COVID. Um, many people think Abby was using it as an excuse to stay in power, but there were also some justified reasons to delay an election at that point. Um, the Grands went ahead anyway, uh, held this election, this regional election. And the result of that, which they, you know, the TPLF won almost all the seats in the regional parliament, the result of that was mutual delegitimization. De 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 Federal government refused to accept the legitimacy of the Tigrayan government. The Tigrayan government, um, you know, by the time I was visiting in October 2020, was declaring Abbey, you know, an, an illegal prime minister who, whose term was up. At that point, the path to war was so clear. Um, but, and as I, again, as I point out in the book, the warning signs were there. You had both sides flexing their muscles, military parades in Addis Ababa, in Tigray, in the streets of Mekele, the regional capital. But, you know, the outside world was not doing nearly enough to try and head off that conflict. And of course, I don't think, you know, maybe there would have been, there was no way to stop it by that point, but there was no real effort um, at all. And I, I argue in the book that the US uh, government at the time tacitly, once it began, tacitly uh, endorsed it, endorsed the federal government's um, operation in Tigray, which had very, even as it very, very quickly became clear that it was not just a war on the TPLF, but a war on, on the region and, uh, as a whole, as forces from multiple sides, from Eritrea, from Amhara, and from, from the federal government um, uh, entered the region and kind of embarked on total war. Um, there was, you know, nothing really happened to, no, there was very little effort to stop that until 2021. Yeah, right, no, and I mean, I think your your book does a very good job. And, and I will say there's always a, you know, risk of, of reading history backwards, so to speak. And, you know, everything of course looks inevitable in, in hindsight, but I think that, you know, in, in really, I guess the second, um, third uh, sections of your book you do a very interesting and and, and good job uh, kind of uh, chronologically laying out this escalating security dilemma that really did i think as you say by the time you were visiting tigray uh in late 2020 um it, it did seem like this this was just kind of this intractable uh, uh loggerheads that that unfortunately and tragically turned very violent um, we didn't have time to get to the, the second part of my question about how Abi won, but I think that that's maybe something that readers can uh, get your take on when they look in the book, because I would like to kind of finish up this um, this discussion today by trying to understand uh, in, in the present day, um, you know, shifting away from uh, the kind of chronology of your book up until, uh, I'd say, early 2024. But kind of looking more towards the future about what you see Ethiopia's role in the broader Red Sea region today and kind of how you see its own uh, kind of internal dynamics and even maybe contradictions, if you will, 
playing out. Because it seems that, you know, on, on the one hand, detractors of Abi can point to the ongoing conflicts that have escalated within Ethiopia, even since the formal end of the Tigray War in, in November 2020, namely the Amhara conflict you, you mentioned earlier, and then this ongoing insurgency in Oromia. But on the other hand, to, despite these internal challenges, Abiy is really positioning Ethiopia as a, a major power in the Red Sea region. Um, and I think it's it's interesting in, in contrast to his first two years or so as a prime minister, when he really kind of used this, embraced this image of a regional peacemaker and was kind of, you know, he didn't really uh, take sides in a lot of these regional conflicts. His point was much more, oh, you know, brothers should come together and embrace Nowadays, he, he seems to be adopting a bit more of kind of a hard-nosed realist and, and maybe even an, an expansionist foreign policy. Um, you know, there are reports of some Ethiopian involvement in, in the, the civil war raging next door in, in Sudan. Um, he'd been drumming up plans since late last year to acquire a naval base in the Red Sea, which now appears to be, you know, in, in the works through this uh, very kind of uh, potent memorandum of understanding with the de facto but unrecognized state of Somaliland. Um, that looks set to have a lot of ramifications uh, around the region. So I'm curious kind of what you see as the, the driving force behind obvious foreign policy. And then, you know, since we all know The Economist predicts the future, um, what will be happening in, in five, 10 years from now, right? If, is it going to be, you know, is is he really charting Ethiopia on this, on this kind of path towards um, achieving this really significant regional uh, kind of influence? Um, or is it going to, you know, is his own regime, in fact, threatened by these ongoing internal conflicts? Or how do you see these two factors maybe kind of playing out in the coming years? Again, recognizing that that's a, another suitably small question. Yeah, um, I think, as you say, there is this kind of contradiction or seeming um, a disconnect between the state of Ethiopia domestically uh, in terms of kind of continual uh, instability and, and insurgency and and everything, and also the economy, which is which is really really in a, mm -hmm. in a, in a terrible sh terrible shape, um, and is only seemingly getting worse. How is Abby able to to even kind of conceive of a regional role? And I think on one level, this is the prophetic side of him. You know this idea that you know his 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 purpose and his stage are bigger than even just Ethiopia, and he has a uh, he has a regional agenda, and you know it is it is his purpose, his divine purpose to to pursue it, including restoring Ethiopia's access to the Red Sea, which is a big part of that, and a big you know I, I made this point in the book that I you know he absolutely I think even when he was dealing with it, with Eritrea in 2018, with that peace deal, you know, was always with an eye to, to the access to the Red Sea, which he sees as historically and rightfully Ethiopia's. Um, so that, that's one element. On a more practical level, though, how can he actually go about, how can he actually um, try to throw Ethiopia's weight around the region without having significant, when, when, when the army is tied up in Amhara, for example, and when the economy is on its knees. I would point again to the, the role of external support. And in this case, it is the United Arab Emirates, which I think is critical. Um, we didn't mention that before, but that's the other really important inter um, external backer. It's one of the reasons we didn't talk about why Abiy won, but obviously uh, military support, including the supply of drones um, from the UAE was, was a big part of it. Um, and I think few would um, doubt today that that Abby is unlikely to have acted so um, boldly or recklessly, take your pick, um, with regards to Somaliland and this new memorandum mm -hmm. of understanding. You mentioned the naval base um, mm -hmm. uh, on well, just south of the Red Sea, but close enough. Uh, that he, you know, that he wants Ethiopia to to build. Um, I can't imagine that he would have done that without having at least some tacit, at least some tacit um, um, support or a green light from from Abu Dhabi. Um, and that's part of the kind of broader regional um, configuration of alliances, which the UAE is at the heart of, which you know. 
many people have have, have written about recently. You know, on the you have the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces in Sudan, um, Hamiti. You have actually Haftar, General Haftar, up in Libya, in eastern Libya. You have uh, Abi in Ethiopia, Somaliland, and the port of Berbera being key. Um, that's the kind of, at least the, the, the core axis with, with kind of Emirati influence in the region. And I think Abi does take sucker from that. And, he, and I think he also receives, uh, I mean, it clearly, and it's just incredibly uh, kind of lacking in transparency, but it's, it's obvious that um, the Emiratis have provided financial support to, to, the, to the Ethiopian government and continued military support. And I think um, diplomatic backing for Ethiopia in its pursuit of um, a naval base in, in the Red Sea. I should say the Emiratis deny this, but um, I, 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 I think the evidence is 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 quite strong that there was at least a, an Emirati hand in this. So I think that helps to explain why he he, he continues to act. So, um, well, you know, I describe it. His regional regional diplomacy is kind of is a maverick is one is a kind of polite way of putting it i would say that the country's neighbors increasingly see ethiopia as a as a kind of dangerous revisionist power um seeking to re re redraw borders uh in the region and just destabilizing um, partly because of the way abby acts as a, as a as a regional um actor he's he's very um uh, opaque and transactional. He doesn't do institutions, regional institutions. He's absolutely not interested in the, a the African Union or, or, or IGAD as well. Um, mm -hmm. Prefers to work, you know, much like his his uh, his ally or patron in the in, in the Gulf. Um, prefers personal relationships to institutions. Um, you, to your final question. What was the final one again? The how this uh, yeah. will affect Ethiopia in the future? Yeah, this is where uh, you you give us the official economist prediction for the Horn of Africa in the next well, uh, five I, to ten I, years. I, uh, <laughs> I really don't think anyone should. I think the the the, the, the most um, uh, powerful lesson from the last five years or six years, uh, six years now. Of Abby's of Abby's tenure is that um, he thrives on on unpredictability and disruption and surprise. Um, so and he did this with the memorandum of understanding announced on January the first of this year. It took everyone by surprise, including the president of Somalia, who would just been right. in Djibouti, um, you know, negotiating with his counterpart in Somaliland and thought they were about to embark on a uh, well the, the latest phase of of negotiating Somaliland status um only to be right. taken by surprise um and i think he was he was pretty angry about that but um that's how that is abby's yeah. kind of modus operandi so you cannot predict that being said i think you know in terms of ethiopia's or the the kind of durability of of his of his regime there are certain variables uh, one of or certain factors to watch one of which is the region is relationships with neighbors because if he does continue to alienate um the countries in the region whether that is somalia through the memorandum of understanding with somaliland whether that is eritrea through the broken alliance with azias after the end of the tigray war or and his and his ploys for a uh, you know a slice of Ethiopia, eritrea's coastline sudan through his backing of the RSF and, and Hamiti uh, in that civil war. This creates a, you know, this creates quite a potent um, nexus of, of hostile uh, states and also non-state actors that might, that they might back, you know, proxy warfare. Mm -hmm. I think as you, you've also written brilliantly on is very much back in the region. And I think that's going to be a huge problem for both Ethiopia's stability and the durability of Abiy's regime. 
just to wrap up quickly, the other two factors I, I would point to are the role of the army, Ethiopia's army, or mm. uh, well, the military now has a very visible public role uh, in a way it hasn't had for decades. Uh, it's this, you know, it's really central to regime survival now. Um, it is, seems to be loyal, at least, you know, from what we can tell. Um, it has been written off as, you know, hope has kind of broken beyond repair too many times, I think, uh, for me to be kind of expecting it to, to mutiny or, or collapse uh, imminently. I think, that, I think that mistake has been made by analysts um, too frequently over the last, too, yeah, too frequently over the last few years. But don't rule it out. Don't rule out a coup d'etat or a mutiny, even if Ethiopia doesn't have a recent history of that. Um, the army is bogged down or increasingly bogged down in wars fighting its own people. Frustrations are likely to grow there. And then finally, the, just to the economy, which is in, I would say, despite the, the official headlines, where the official statistics which the government keeps um, rolling out is clearly um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a worse state than it has been for, for many, many years, facing a balance of payments crisis, Maybe an IMF program will come in the you know the next few weeks or months, and that might stave off an emergency, um, uh, you know, economic emergency. But in the long term, I don't I don't think the economic future of Ethiopia is as it currently you know without particularly without stability is not uh, is not is not a rosy one, um, and that means that discontent on a popular level will grow and also the supply of rents he needs to to reward uh, to keep loyalists on side will 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 dwindle so i think there are a few different things to watch but my kind of i guess my top line and um i could regret saying this but i don't think the regime or abby is about to to to, to fall i don't think he's going anywhere imminently for the reasons I laid out, um, but I, you know, Ethiopia under Abiy Ahmed has been has been a has been a roller coaster full of surprises. So I'm, I, I I I would, you know, I I I, I may eat my words, <laughs> put it that way. Yeah, well, that's. I mean, this is certainly a region where I think. Um... Uh, no one should be making predictions with too much confidence uh, or, or too too much precision. So I think yeah. you did very well handling my last uh, semi-trick question there. You're right that there are just so many different factors at play. And, you know, Abi, I think, has has uh, shown himself to be and, and surprised many observers with kind of, um, you know, a lot of the, the decisions he's made so far. These aren't things that are necessarily easy to read kind of uh, um, uh, in the lead up. So I think that there's uh, a lot of uh, room there still for, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, of course, and so many different factors at play. But I think that that's a very good place to end our conversation today, uh, though I hope that uh, the conversation will continue in uh, one form or another as we try to make sense of the profound um, and unfortunately often quite chaotic transformations underway in the Horn of Africa and, and Red Sea region today. So once again, the book is titled The Avi Project. God, Power, and War in the New Ethiopia. Uh, and it's now available for purchase for any of our viewers in the United Kingdom. They can get it via Hearst Publishers. Anyone wanting to pre-order the book in the United States uh, or North and South America, I believe, uh, as a whole, can do so through Oxford University Press website. And uh, you mentioned that there's a, a discount code, right? Am I, am I allowed to read that or is that privileged confidential information? No, no, please go ahead. All right. I, ha I have it here as a, a DISTA-5, uh, Alpha, Delta, India, Sierra, Tango, Alpha-5. So that will get you a 30% discount on, on pre-order. Um, and of course, you can follow Tom's reporting at The Economist. He's now, I believe you're, you're based in or, or about to be based in Nairobi and, and covering uh, the continent as a whole. So please continue to uh, you know follow that writing. And of course, you can and should follow Hudson Institute. For more insightful events on, on global affairs such as these, uh, both in, in different parts of Africa uh, and then, of course, all over the world. So let me take the opportunity once again to say thank you, Tom, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in today. Thank you.